Hi everyone, English 4113, class 23 on the second part of Beloved. I've got an image here from a 2013 exhibition at Sikkim and Jenkins by the American artist Kara Walker, born in 1969. She's an important chronicler and of African-American experience of the legacy of slavery and racism, an extremely ironic and strange artist. Um, I have an image here, which I think is probably some of the milder stuff she's done. Uh, here's the title of it, and I'm not going to read every word in it. The N-word Huck Finn pursues happiness beyond the narrow constraints of your overdetermined thesis on freedom, drawn and courted by Mr. Carol Walkerberry, with condolences to the authors. And you can see she has a kind uh, American eyes, maybe kind of a black Huck Finn character here, maybe and some white man about to be beaten. She uses these caricatures of Black people oftentimes in her art and these silhouettes. Uh, so I just recommend you look up some of her stuff. It's, uh, it's shocking, um, but very important. I can talk to you in, in more detail on Tuesday about, about uh, some of the stuff I've seen over the years by her. So let's now talk about Beloved. Uh, in this talk here, I'm going to talk about the uncanny. Uh, so I think it's an important category for understanding how Morrison's novel works. I'm going to talk about her various ways of playing with points of view. Um, I'm going to talk about the structure of the book and just point out some of the features of structure. And hopefully you can start thinking about those things in some detail. And I'm also just going to pose a question at the end of whether or not we can still read this novel for character, which I suspect is probably how you want to read it. So first off, let's talk about the uncanny. The key uh, form person who formulated ideas about the uncanny is the Austrian psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud. Uh, and he's very interested in the way that the German words heimlich and unheimlich mean exactly the same thing, but also not quite. Uh, heimlich is something that feels comfortable and homey. Uh, unheimlich also means that, but um, unheimlich also means kind of unsettling, eerie, right? And so this word unheimlich typically translated into English as the uncanny captures that feeling of something being what it is, familiar, but also having this kind of quality of unfamiliarity underneath it. Think of when you're having a dream and you think I was in a house, but it wasn't my house. And I met my parents, but they weren't my parents. Or say you're walking around the city and you walk down a street, you think, have I been here already before? And you might have that slight shiver come over you. The uncanny is that feeling of maybe being visited by someone who should be dead. That's one of the key examples Freud is talking about in his long essay on the uncanny. And of course, he's working as a psychoanalyst and therapist and trying to think about this psychological quality that we often experience in our lives. But it's an important literary quality uh, term as well, because it really helps capture the way that a lot of literature works and helps uh, steer us away from certain mistakes we might make in our interpretations. Of course, the uncanny is enormously important for an understanding beloved. So we can uh, we can observe all kinds of features of kind of unsettling doubleness in this novel. Of course, motherhood is one of the key ones. Again, as I told you, that in, uh, in American slavery, um, for most of the history of, of uh, slavery by the colonizers here, um, if a child born to a mother was not did not belong to that mother because it was born to her, right? Belonged to the master. So because it was hers, it was not hers. That double quality is something that this novel is about. It is and it isn't at the same time. Uh, and to say it's one or the other clearly is to sort of erase that complication. It's something that even when Setha murders her child, um, it's something that doesn't really quite do away with the way that it, by murdering the child, she's sort of given it over to, well, death and it is no longer hers, but it is hers too, right? Um, is that house they live in, one, two, four, is it their house or not their house? Well, technically and legally, no, it doesn't belong to them, but even so, they're living there. It's the place where they live, it's their house. But when a ghost moves, moves into your house, it's not your house anymore, right? The house belongs to the ghost, and you're, you've taken up residence there. That's how ghost stories work. When a ghost is in your house, that's the ghost's house, it's not yours. Um, 
belonging? Is it in the novel? Is belonging to someone? Is it a terrible thing or not? Is being in love with someone a terrible thing or not? Is being attached to someone terrible or not? Right? There's no easy answer to any of this. Um, and what is beloved? Is she a ghost? Is she all enslaved people who are drowned come back? Is she Seth's daughter? Um, how old is she? Is she two years old? Is she 20? She doesn't have wrinkles in her hands like a, like a little child, but she's a grown woman too. Uh, and there's something absolutely monstrous about this, about this creature that's a ghost and not a ghost, that's Setha's child and not her child, that is two years old and 20 years old. It's incredibly unsettling. And to say it's any one of those things is to really violate how this novel is working, right? The un keeping the unheimlich in mind, keeping the uncanny in mind. If you always say, we're not going to resolve these things into any one thing or the other thing, always gonna to try to preserve that feeling of unsettledness is then you'll, I think, honor the way this novel is working. So we can look at a scene like this, a conversation between Denver and Beloved. What is it, asked Denver. Look, as Beloved, she points to the sunlit cracks. What, I don't see nothing. Denver follows the pointing finger. Beloved but drops her hand. I'm like this. Denver watches as Beloved bends over, curls up, and rocks. Her eyes go to no place. Her moaning is so small, Denver can hardly hear it. She's, you know, like a little turtle shape. Are you all right, Beloved? Beloved focuses her eyes over there, her face. Denver looks where Beloved eyes go. There's nothing but darkness there. Who's faced? Who is it? Me. It's me. She's looking at herself. What is she looking at here? She is smiling again. She's she's happy. She's pleased. She's connected. What is she seeing, right? And answering this in any absolutely certain sense, I think it's going to do and just kind of dishonor to Morrison's prose, right? We have to somehow read this passage and preserve all those feelings of kind of ooginess, right? that we get while we're reading it, where we don't really know where we are. How can you do literary criticism that preserves all, preserves all those things? That's your job, right? Um, so one of the other ways this novel works is through a third person limited point of view where Morrison is switching between uh, different characters' point of view. She's not, they're not quite different first persons. They're all third person, but each one of them has a limited point of view. They, we get deep into their own heads. So there, of course, this, this happens uh, Famously in Virginia Woolf's novels, Mrs. Dalloway uses this to the lighthouse uses this. If you've ever read Woolf, then you're familiar with it. But now that you've read Morrison, you could read Woolf if you've never read Woolf before. She's great. So uh, here are some examples. Um, breathing and murmuring, breathing and murmuring. Beloved heard them as soon as the door banged shut behind her. She dumped at the slam and swiveled her head towards the whispers coming from behind the white stairs. So that's, that's a point of view of Beloved as she comes into the house and she sees Setha and Paul D. Uh, he's naked and he's embracing her and they've disappeared to go upstairs and have sex and Beloved is, is very jealous. She's a, she's a two-year-old, right? She's very jealous. She wants her mom all to herself, like a two-year-old. Once upon a time, she had known more and wanted to, had walked the path leading to a real other house, had stood outside the window, listening. That's Denver, that's, Den that's Denver's points of view. And we're, and we're being told about the time when she went and had some schooling. Um, and again, this is a limited point of view. Who knows about this? Well, not beloved. Not everybody, Paul D doesn't know about this, right? That limited point of view also creates a little space where characters know things that other characters don't. But we as a reader are getting privileged access to almost everybody, right? Um, she did not look at them. She simply swung the baby towards the wall planks, missed and tried to connect a second time, went out of nowhere. And the ticking time the men spent staring at what there was to stare at, the old N-word boy, still mewing, ran through the door behind them and snatched the baby from the arc of its mother's swing. And that's the point of view of the slave catchers. And you will notice that just like Frances Harper, Toni Morrison does not let us into the mind of the mother who's killing her child. We are not inside that point of view. We're gonna get something like it later in the novel, but we're still never gonna be fully in it in that moment. We are not allowed to witness that. Frances Harper doesn't give it to us. Toni Morrison does not give it to us. So think about point of view as a way of focusing our attention, but also of limiting it and pay attention to whose point of view we're denied and when, right? It's very important to understanding how this novel is put together. So now we can talk a little bit about structure. And here are some ideas I'm getting from a school of criticism called Russian formalism, uh, developed 
almost 100 years ago by a Russian named Viktor Shlovsky, who lived from 1893 to the ripe old age of uh, whatever he was, 1984, so that's 91 years old. Uh, and he developed these ideas in an essay he first wrote in 1921, so 100, well, 99 years ago, the novelist parody Stern's Tristram Shandy, uh, published again in 1929 in a book called The Theory of Prose. So Shlovsky is very interested in the way that, uh, trying to figure out how it is that literature actually works. And his key idea is that literature creates a feeling of estrangement. It makes the way you look at the world normally somewhat strange. And so it will describe a chair in a way that you don't, you're like, oh, that's what a chair is, right? Something you see every day, and then you see it in a new way, or maybe politics, or maybe a person, or maybe a smell, or maybe a flower or the sky or what have you. And that one of these uh, ways that literature achieves this with this all important uh, task of estrangement or defamiliarization, depending on how you translate a Russian word, I'm not going to say. Um, one of the ways it does that is by splitting story from plot. And this is what he talks about in one sentence in his essay on a really important 18th century novel, Tristram Shandy. So uh, Shlovsky writes, the concept of plot Sujet is too often confused with a description of the events in the novel with what I tentatively call the storyline, Babla. As a matter of fact, though, the storyline is nothing more than material for plot formation. So this is very important, right? The story is just the events. It's just what happened. The plot, that's the important thing for art, for literary art. It's how it's arranged. And Morrison's novel is very much plot driven in this sense, the sense taken from Russian formalism. So I gave you a timeline of the novel, my previous talk on Unbeloved. Now I'm going to tell you that basically Morrison plays with that story in all kinds of ways, right? You're, you're constantly switching back and forth. So it's not really straightforward chronology that she gives you. Remember that nearly every event of the novel appears in the opening 20 pages, and then much, much of the rest of the novel unfolds as memories. Memories, of course, don't proceed in any particular order. Memories come to us in the way that we are some, sometimes stuck by something, and then we remember something, never necessarily in the order it occurred to us, right? Memory is always present to us in the way that, say, your children are always your children, no matter how old they are. They're never grown, right? That's what Seth has said. So that feature of presence is one of the ways the novels um, remember this term it's plot works right um, so sometimes the structure of this novel is very straightforward however if you look at the way the chapters abut on one another or paragraphs abut on one another so for example when baby suggs arrives we get a whole chapter describing her arrival in cincinnati and her leaving the garners and her thinking, you know, well, you, you know, I've been set free, but you've cheated my son. You've got the best years of his life and you just sold off me. I'm a broken down person. Uh, but then, and that immediately precedes the arrival of the slave catcher. So two people arriving in Cincinnati, one a, uh, an enslaved woman, and then the capture of an escaped a slave woman um, who's going to uh, free herself and her family by killing one member of them. Uh, so that's a very straightforward uh, structure, right? These chapters belong together. But sometimes it's much more elusive. So there's that scene, which is always so difficult to teach and read, where a beloved, well, we could say maybe she rapes Paul D, she possesses Paul D into having sex with her. What's going on there? I've never been able to quite figure out exactly what to call it. Uh, rape is probably the safest thing to call it because certainly Paul D feels absolutely humiliated and horrified by what's happened. Uh, and right before that, we have a chapter on Paul D's travails on the chain gang, his escape and his wandering. He's feeling like he's being pushed around. And that seems to kind of hint at thematically what's going to happen between Beloved and Paul D. But then after, we get a chapter on Denver's longing for Beloved's attention and their attempts, Setha and Denver, to try to figure out what Beloved is. Why does that chapter go there? Well, we can talk about that in class. But it's the chapter after is the one that returns to Paul D's shame in his attempt to regain his manhood by proposing to Setha that they have a child together. He means to confess to her what happened, but he can't, he can't bring himself to do it. You would imagine that chapter might want to go immediately after the scene between Beloved and Paul D, but that's not where Morrison puts it. She delays it. And we can talk about why that is in class. Think about the structure of the novel. It's very important. So what didn't I do in this talk? Well, 
I didn't talk about character. I didn't say, well, this is what I think Paul D is really thinking. This is what I think Seth is really thinking, right? They're not people. They make you feel like they're people, but the words on the page, they are the invention of Toni Morrison. She's, a, she's an artist, she's a writer, and she created these, these characters and they are there to do her bidding, right? And to call out to us in the way that words call out to us and to make us believe they're people, but it's all make believe, right? They're not people. And so we don't talk about their motivations either, apart from what the novel tells us. What is Setha really thinking? What does she really want? Well, whatever Morrison tells us, right? She's not a person. She doesn't have ulterior motives unless we're told that she does, or unless this particular cultural context makes us believe that she does, or unless there's some kind of ironic third person narrator, uh, narrative device where we're somehow removed from what it is that Setha actually wants and feels. Right? And we see that with the slave catchers, there's a very ironic description of what it is they're feeling and wanting. And we know the true violence behind everything they're saying. Right? But that's not about motivations of people, it's about cultural context. Right? And that cultural context is embedded in the novel, it's how the novel works. So we can't really then talk about what the characters are really thinking, unless the novel is causing us to kind of doubt that by giving us some indication that we're meant to think there's some split between what we're being told the characters are thinking and what they're maybe doing or thinking elsewhere, right? But again, they're not people. You're good at analyzing people, probably. It's something you do every day, but you're not necessarily trained to spend a lot of time thinking about literature or difficult literature or complicated literature, right? So I'm trying to point you in the direction of asking literary questions. So I also don't diagnose these people. I don't say, oh, what is Setha? Is she sick? Is she mentally ill? Is Paul D. sad? Is he depressed? Well, yes, he's depressed. Cut lie, as Morrison tells us he is, right? Uh, finding out that he's depressed isn't going to tell us anything about the novel or how it works, right? Morrison tells us all we need to know. And so then we just need to try to find the patterns of this book to try to understand how it's, wor how it's working, right? So why not read for character? Um, because none of those questions are strictly literary, right? You can, you can do that. You can talk about character, but I don't think it's going to lead you to ask questions about, they're going to lead you to understand the novel better as a novel. And if you want to be a creative writer, I don't think it's going to make you a better writer. You need to understand how these things are built and made, right? Um, because asking those questions about character don't, don't really tell us much about what Morrison did to the Garner story. And she does all kinds of interesting things to the Garner story. And we'll talk about that in class tomorrow. And it also doesn't tell us why she put the novel together in the way she did. The subject and the plot are not the same thing, right? Or the fabula and the plot, right? They use those terms from Shlotsky. They're not the same thing. Why did she put the novel in the way, together in the way that she did, right? We have to ask that through literary questions, not through character questions. So, but you can still talk about character because it will tell you things about how the novel is working. So I would suggest pausing the screen or rereading it. It's on page 125. It's a long description where Paul D is remembering his time at the Garners when, when Garner, both the Garners were still alive, the, the husband and wife. And he felt like he got respect there and felt like he was being treated well, he and the other enslaved men, and felt like they were being treated like men. And he's remembering this and having a kind of weird pride, longing, nostalgia. It's hard to tell what this feeling is that Morrison's trying to evoke. And what's happening here is we're not supposed to read the straight. Certainly Morrison is not asking us to read the straight, because what happens, of course, is that once Mr. Garner dies, it doesn't really matter how well he's treated these men he's enslaved. It doesn't really matter because they're exposed to the world in which they are still slaves. And so Morrison needs us, wants us, I believe, to understand that Paul D's memory of this, of this experience is something that's completely dissonant with the actual experience of enslavement. It's, it's somehow even crueler to have been treated as a man and to have your intellect enslaved as well as your body. Right? Uh, so this is a sort of character reading, but it's really, um, you can ask why is Morrison writing the character this way? What is it she's wanting us to think? What, how is this advancing with the novel? Is trying to accomplish is exploring the legacy and the trauma of slavery in the way that people survive it in the years following. So those are good character-based questions. I'm not asking what does Paul D really think? I'm asking what is Morrison doing here? Okay, looking forward to our conversation tomorrow.